we never saw it coming. What? Whoa! What's that? That's really coming back? New waifu material? Whoa! Oh my gosh! My hype levels are reaching critical! Japanese coverage of JRPGs is usually miles ahead of coverage in the West. Duh. Not necessarily to the fault of Western journalists, but more so the slow pace of localization and lack of effort from publishers advertising the game out West. We exist too, you know! But thanks to the power of the internet, we are able to join Japan on their gaming hype train after we translate everything to English. The same goes for Three Houses. While Nintendo of America has remained relatively quiet, aside from the occasional post on Twitter, Fire Emblem Fever is sweeping the Japanese fanbase. We have every other day Twitter posts, Three Houses website updates, and Famitsu releasing not one, but two Three Houses features in their magazine since the February Direct. In fact, those two featured articles might as well be directs on their own when you consider all the new details packed inside. That's why I want to dive deep into these new details and piece together what we can of Three Houses. Some of the new info confirms gameplay and plot details I had already pointed out in my previous analysis trailer, and some of it deconfirms my theories. I can't be right all the time, I mean, come on. But no matter if I was wrong or right, we're still going to uncover crucial tidbits the Famitsu articles and Nintendo Post have to offer. I'll be referring to my previous analysis videos fairly often, so be sure to watch those as well. Also, my Japanese isn't the best, and while I do a lot of my own translation, there are still some vocabulary and kanji I don't know. So I'll be using Serenus Forest's translation from time to time. Also, also, this info is everything we know as of May 19th. Excuse me for missing anything after that. Now get your diving gear ready. We're going deep. The Divine Seros received a revelation from the Goddess. A gift to help guide the lost. First, we need to touch on the concept that will be keeping me up at night for the next two months. The Crests. As you well already know, the Crests were gifts handed down by the Goddess to bless the people of Fodlan. We've also established that the symbols surrounding this artwork are indeed the crests. What we now know is that there are many, many more crests than I had first anticipated. I don't mean new symbols, more like you can find 20 versions of one crest in Fodlan. The Famitsu article states crests are passed down through the bloodline of the Ten Greats, warriors who fought in the Hero War many years ago. More on the Hero War later. Why there are only 10 greats when there are 21 crests is beyond me. Maybe the goddess gave the heroes each two crests and the Church of Seros one? Or there are ten more heroes we aren't aware of. Wait, the church has a crest? You bet your lolly dragon they have a crest. The mystery of the flower bud has been resolved! We can now call it by its true name, the Crest of Seros. So if we count two crests for each hero and one for Seros, that equals 21. Unfortunately, I have no definite proof that the Ten Greats had more than two crests, meaning there could be a different source for the remaining ten, we just don't know about it yet. However, the Famitsu article points out that members of the noble class are descendants of the Ten Greats, implying that the Ten Greats' bloodline is required to have a crest. Because of that, part of me doubts the crest would come from anywhere other than the Ten Greats. The article goes on to say that despite being of noble birth, some noble offspring do not receive a crest, and an even smaller number of crest wielders can actually invoke magic. There are also two kinds of crests to consider. Those who show their power strongly have major crests, and those who are slightly weaker show minor crests. That begs the question, where do these crests appear? While a lot of you might be hoping for a birthmark on the left butt cheek, shikosh, I think it has something to do with the scene here. Here we see Edelgard showing off her magic skills, or so I thought. I now think she's showing off her crest. If that's the case, every noble who has a crest can do this magic trick. The strength of the crest is believed to be based on how strong the hero bloodline is, although some children who are thought to have thin relation to the Ten Greats can suddenly get a major crest. The reason this happens is unknown. So the mystery of the crest is solved, right? Not at all. We still don't understand why the Black Beast is wielding a crest of Gautier, or why this crest is oozing all sorts of nastiness. But I do have two theories. What if there are still physical crests in the world that provide power to crest wielders, and this oozing crest is one of them? Maybe, but it's hard to believe they would take away magic from one of your units once you destroy a crest. Another theory is, what if there are just stones in this world that contain the power of the crests? Because people fuse their crests into stone? I'm grasping at straws here, people. 
As for what the crests do gameplay-wise, I'm not entirely sure. From what I understand, it unlocks physical and magical talents, but it's not clear what those are. The article also lumps crests together with skills, so perhaps the crests you wield determines some of the skills you have. But then there are units without crests who have skills? It's all very complicated. It's also possible the crests only serve story purposes. Some people are comparing it to the Holy Blood and Genealogy of the Holy War, a game I have admittedly not played. In it, the difference between Major and Minor Blood was Major Blood can equip special weapons where Minor Blood just existed. That said, Genealogy also had second generation units, and in order to wield the special weapons, they had to have Major Blood given to them through their parents. There's no indication there will be children unit in three houses, please no, but the similarities between the two is worth pointing out. Next, let's go over the new info about some of the characters and their crests. Starting with the best girl, Dorothea. That's right, it's her world, everyone's just living in it. The humblest diva you'll ever meet. Her hat doesn't belong in Fire Emblem. I didn't realize people disliked her that much. Okay, we'll just start with the main character then. Hilda. Stop gushing over your potential waifus. Fine, fine, I'll move on to the real main character. Jeez. Edelgard. Originally a part-time mercenary, Beleth is hired by the Church of Saros to be a professor at the Officer's Academy after he saves three students from bandits. Gee, I wonder who the three students are. The article also mentions your mom died, which must be relevant if they go out of their way to mention it. Or maybe it's just a rite of passage for main protagonist to have one dead parent, if not both. Don't think you're out of the woods yet, Dad. Mom may be dead, but you're one death flag away from becoming my reason to kill the final dragon boss. Surprisingly, Beleth also has a crest of their own, but it's not one of the 21 crests. In reality, there are now 22. Except this crest seems to be a new one never before seen in Fulden. Although this isn't our first time seeing this crest. In fact, it's been right in front of our faces from the very beginning. I pointed this out in my last analysis, but this mysterious crest has the same form as this painting. It's possible this crest is actually the most important out of them all, and maybe even the Fire Emblem. So why do Sothis, Beleth, and Old Man Viking King all have the mysterious crest? We'll come back to that. Of course, Beleth's story will be heavily tied to the old Lady Lolly Dragon, Sothis. She appears before Beleth after he's attacked by a bandit. As you go about the game, she communicates with you in your mind, like in the middle of the battlefield. It's almost as if she lives in Beleth's head. That's not creepy. Sothis has the body of a young child, but talks like an older woman, which is something I pointed out in my analysis. Go to die for me? This must mean she's incredibly old, and not just a young Manakeet like Tiki. In her new art, she's holding the whip sword, making her the third wielder of the sword besides Beleth, the other two being Old Man Viking King and the Lady in White from the E3 trailer. But why is Sothis holding the sword? If it's in her key art, the sword and her must have a connection. Remember how I theorized this sword whip might be the falchion of three houses? Falchions, in the past, were made from the fangs of Naga, the big mama Manakeet goddess. So if the sword whip is more or less a falchion, then there has to be a dragon that gave up a fang. Perhaps, and this is just my theorizing here, perhaps the sword whip is made from Sothis's fang, or the fang of one of her descendants. What other reason would she have to hold the sword? But besides that, there's nothing that stands out in the art. Nope. Nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. Completely boring. Not exciting in any way. Pervert. Interestingly, she has no memory of who she is or about her past. The only thing she can remember is her name. Ah, good old amnesia. You never let us down. The fact she has amnesia must mean they are hiding her background. Previously, I mentioned Seros and Sothis are two names of the same star, Sirius, so I speculated that they are the same person. However, since we now know Seros has a crest, and Sothis is wearing Beleth's crest, I don't think the theory holds up anymore. Maybe Sothis and Seros are siblings? Or rival followers of the goddess? Either way, Sothis has to be related to Seros in some capacity. So that returns us to a question we failed to answer last video. Who is Seros? Well, we know who it's not. Palutena, I mean Rhea, is the highest ranking archbishop in the Church of Seros, basically the Pope. She has a gentle demeanor and treats others with utmost kindness, 
almost like a mother, but she won't hesitate to pass merciless judgment on those who defy the church. Kind of like my mother. Oh gosh, let's not do that. <laughs> but she won't hesitate to pass merciless judgment on those who defy the church. You know, typical powerful church leader stuff. She can pass merciless judgment on me any day. <laughs> Please stop. As to whether or not she is evil, that remains to be seen. I think we'll see a form of corruption within the church, but my gut is telling me they won't make Rhea the in-game villain. Then again, that might be more of my desires overtaking my reasoning. Now, who am I kidding? She's gonna be evil. A side note, her name comes from the Greek titan of the same name, the Mother of the Gods. Besides driving home her motherly personality, I'm not sure if the origin of the name means anything in the long run. It's something to keep in mind, I guess. In the past, I debated whether or not Rhea was actually Seros, but now that we know her name, we can finally confirm she is not Seros. Maybe. Look, you can't rule anything out when you're dealing with Monokites. Although it's possible Rhea isn't a Monokite, especially since Geralt knows her, pointy ears would also be the biggest sign, but her hair covers her ears, so we just can't tell. For now, let's just say Rhea and Seros are not the same person. After all, recent footage of Rhea speaking proves that she is the voice in the beginning of the E3 trailer who talks about Seros. I call it, baby! All you doubters out there. So what does that mean for the lady in white? We'll talk about that later. Wins later! Daddy Geralt is a former knight of Seros and is considered to be the greatest of all time. How am I supposed to live up to that, hmm? He left the order to form his own mercenary group and travel around Fulden. Again, the Twitter post mentioned his wife, Beleth's mother, has passed away, potentially placing more importance on her. But you know what? Something about this sounds familiar. Like I've seen a Fire Emblem character with the same background before. Father of protagonist, a former knight, turned mercenary, dead wife? Hmm, must be my imagination. For one reason or another, everyone is saying he's gonna die. Look on the Twitter comments, it's everywhere. Even the Japanese people are like, yeah, this guy's gonna die. And let's be honest, the track record for Fathers in Fire Emblem has not been great. But I hope Intelligent Systems fools everyone by letting Geralt survive, or at least make it to end game. Oh, how I miss my wife. Just stop saying that! And now we'll start covering the students, starting with the Black Eagles. The head of the Black Eagles, Edelgard is the Imperial Princess of the Drestian Empire and heir to the throne. Despite having the background of a typical medieval villain, Edelgard seems like a kind, humble person. She carries a dignified air about her, while also calmly evaluating her surroundings before acting. Grade A waifu material. She wields a minor crest of Seros, which proves once again how closely related the Adrestian Empire is to Seros and the church. It makes you wonder if Rhea has a crest as well. Would it be Seros's crest? Food for thought. Next is Emo Guy. Hubert. <laughs> Hubert. His name's Hubert. All I'm gonna say is he doesn't look like a Hubert. He looks like a guy who changed his name from Hubert to Despair. Odd name aside, Hubert has served Edelgard since a young age. He's basically the strategist of the Black Eagles and will do anything in his power to get rid of obstacles in Edelgard's way. Apparently, Edelgard says he's cool once you get to know him. What a great wing woman. Hubert, unfortunately, doesn't have a crest, despite being the son of the Marquis Vestra House. Finally, we get to talk about the walking JoJo reference, Dorothea. She's probably the closest we'll get to a pop idol in a Fire Emblem game. <clears throat> a canon Fire Emblem game. Before entering the Academy, she was a popular singer at the Middle Frank Opera Company. She says she left the opera because you never know when your idol popularity will die. Maybe they had a phantom problem. Your joke was bad and you should feel bad. Dorothy is the only commoner in the Black Eagles, and at times feels out of place. However, she treats anybody her age equally as friends. Being a commoner, Dorothea doesn't have a crest, but she for sure uses magic. Also, her name in Greek means Gift of God, and let me tell you, she is the greatest gift God has ever given me. Oh my gosh, get a life! Next we have the Blue Lions. As you already know, Dimitri is the head of the Blue Lions, and heir to the Fargus Kingdom. When he's not studying or practicing with a spear, you can find him at his part-time job at McDonald's. He's a sincere young man who embodies everything chivalrous, although there is a faint tinge of darkness hiding behind those golden arches. Oh no, everyone, we have a bad boy up in here. To no one's surprise, Dimitri has the minor crest of Bledad. Bledad? 
Bladied? Blah, blah, bladed. That name. Next is Big Man Tiny X. Dido. Dido? Do do? Do duo. Do do. Man, they are killing it with these names. Also, I looked up what Dudo is, and apparently it's a Chinese undershirt. So until we get an official translation for his name, I'm going to make him wear this. Beautiful. He kind of has a Native American vibe going on with his build and eagle earrings he has. Maybe it's more Ainu? Mm. Well, whatever the case, he comes from the northwest part of the Fargus Kingdom and is Dimitri's servant. He owes a lot to Dimitri, probably saved his life or family or something, and would do anything to help Dimitri like covering his shifts at McDonald's. But don't let his size fool you. Dudu is a gentle giant. Since Dudu is a commoner, he does not have a crest. Blue-haired swordsman name is Felix. He's childhood friends with Dimitri, who he lovingly calls Boar. Boar? Really? There are a ton of better names to call him. Ronald McDonald, Limp Noodle, Pasta Head, Golden Arches. So much potential and you went with Boar. Frankly, I'm disappointed. But Felix doesn't care about witty sayings and good comebacks. He just wants to hone his sword skills. Felix actually has a crest. And what do you know, it's a major crest of Fredaris. The first major crest we've seen. It's kind of weird the house heads only have minor crests, while Felix has a major one. Maybe the difference just isn't that great. Lastly is the Golden Deer. The head of the Golden Deer is Claude, prince of the new leader of the Leicester Alliance, Reagan. He seems like a pretty chill dude, but you can't let your guard down around him. He has multiple sides to him, from what I understand, which makes sense. Claude Von Riegen by day, Spider-Man by night. Although I don't think he has legs. Claude has a minor crest of Riegen. A snob who knows how to get the job done, Loretz is the eldest son of the Duke Gloucester house. But don't fret, ladies. He's single and ready to mingle. Think of it this way. The closer you get to Loretz, the closer you get to his friend Claude. Is it a terrible tactic? Yes. Is it effective? Yes. I kind of feel bad for Claude. Edelgard and Dimitri have tacticians and servants who will die for them, while Claude is stuck with the lover boy over here. Claude, I need you to help me pick up chicks. Lorette says the minor class of Gloucester. Finally, we get to Hilda, who has been around since the E3 trailer, but we've heard nothing about her since. She's the lazy type of noble who was spoiled as a child, not a bad or even lethargic person based on the way she speaks, more like I'd rather have someone else do it for me. I'm sure this will be the source of many a hilarious joke. Hilda, I need you to take out their axe users over there. Eh, I don't really feel like it. What do you mean you don't feel like it? Can't you get someone more capable to do it? Trust me, I would, but you're the only one over there at the moment. I have no choice but to ask you. See, that's your problem. You asked me. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Hilda! Hilda has a minor crest of Gonoril. In case you were wondering, Claude, Lorenz, and Hilda's crests are all on the Lester coat of arms. And now to round out the character marathon, we have two professors. Manuela is the former star of the Empire's Middle Frank Opera Company, turned teacher and doctor at the Academy. Talk about a diverse set of talents. Dorothea sees Manuela as her opera senpai, so I'm sure there'll be a very minor side plot about that. She apparently has a cruel side to her, but treats the main character kindly, so I guess that's good enough. Also, I totally nailed the fact that she's looking for a boyfriend in my analysis trailer. Something about her design just screams, I'm desperate! Manuela might also be a recruitable unit as we see her casting fire magic in the first E3 trailer. Instead of being known as Professor Diamonds are a man's best friend, he's actually known as Professor Crests are a man's best friend. Meet Hanneman, a professor at the academy and a researcher of crests given by the goddess to humanity. He's usually a reserved person, but once he hears the word crest brought into a conversation, he can't help but show his excitement. As such, he's quite enthusiastic learning more about Beleth and the crest they wield. They also mention he doesn't get along with Manuela very well. Probably because she doesn't have a crest. Just saying. Guess we know what his favorite toothpaste is. <laughs> you just couldn't help yourself, could you? Just, you just had to do it. You saw the opportunity and you took it. I'm sorry. Just I... sit down! Okay. And acquire special skills such as horsemanship. Characters in Three Houses have more than just unique personalities and crests, though. They also possess unique skills. And the Famitsu article kindly explained in detail the three different kinds of skills. 
personal, class, and professor skills. Personal skills are unique to the individual, although it's limited to one. For example, Dorothea's personal skill is Songstress, which allows her to restore 10% of adjacent allies' health at the beginning of each turn. A fitting skill for a pub idol. Hubert's personal skill is Strategious, which boosts Gambit might by five. Now I'm not going to cover every unit's personal skill, but I do want to point out that the three amigos have similar personal skills. The skill is based on their bloodline, and it boosts experience growth by 1.2%. I also believe we can see those personal skills on the battlefield UI. Edelgard and Dimitri have similar crown skills, while Savan and Hilda have different ones. Could be a different skill, but judging how early in the game this is, I think these are personal skill icons. Class skills are granted based on the class you are in, but they disappear once you change classes. Fairly straightforward. Don't think you become all the classes and hoard all the skills. Doesn't work that way. Professor skills are gained from one-on-one -on -one time with Beleth during classroom instruction. We first saw this in the last direct, so check my analysis trailer for more details on that. This time, however, we confirmed that weapon skills with level one on them are the professor skills, and they give a bonus to your stats if you use the weapon. For example, Bernadetta should get a bonus because she is using a bow with the bow skill equipped. The higher grade in a weapon, the higher skill level you unlock. Lastly, remember the three stars on the tutoring menu? We now know that these stars indicate a hidden talent, even if they are bad at that particular skill. Little by little, the stars will fill up until a new talent is unlocked. Not only do they become skilled in that category, but they obtain new abilities. Their bonds will strengthen, and they'll be able to better support each other on the battlefield. Another massive reveal was battalions. At the Knights Guild, located somewhere on the grounds of the monastery, you can hire battalions to accompany your students on their missions. These battalions range from offensive to defensive, and physical to magical supports. Authority is the professor's skill associated with the battalions. For example, anybody can use E-level battalions. To use the stronger battalions, however, you need a stronger level of authority. In the example Famitsu provides, we can see a Pegasus Knight Battalion requiring a D rank in authority, and a Cavalry requiring C rank. However, the battalions are not free. It'll cost at least 1,000 gold, and I'm sure that minimum will go up the stronger you get. Thankfully, replenishing your battalion strength costs very little in comparison. That said, I don't think money is an issue for the player. 8,900 gold? Looks like someone knows how to pay their armies properly, unlike a certain game I know. This menu also lists the battalion's HP. Remember the three triangles from the February Direct? I hypothesized in my analysis that they represented the health of the battalion. And what do you know? I was right. As health is depleted, the number of triangles and color changes. Three green triangles is three-fourths health, two yellow triangles is one-half health, and one red triangle is one-fourth health. To clarify, when I say health, I mean strength. So the healthier the battalion, the stronger they will be. They take damage when the unit takes damage, although I'm not entirely sure how that works out. It's probably one for one, but it didn't confirm that. A single gambit comes with each battalion, and it looks as though the gambit can be used more than once a mission, depending on the battalion. These special moves come in a wide variety of attacks and spells, so I won't list them all, but it's interesting to note that they are not all for attacking. Some gambits lure enemies, others heal allies. The different combinations offers quite a few options to what's looking like an incredibly customizable game. When you equip a battalion, buffs and debuffs are given to the character's stats. Gotta have some risk and reward. However, there is a never before seen stat called Charisma. Not clear on how it affects the battalion, but I can tell you Hubert's gonna need a lot of it. Come on, sweetie, smile more! You'd be so pretty if you smiled more. Intelligence systems must have been impressed with Persona 4 and 5 because many of the school aspects are borrowed right from the game. Um, there's already a Persona-like Fire Emblem game? Tokyo Mirage Sessions, duh! Oh wow, aren't you so smart? Do you want a cookie? Do you want a cookie? Yes. Well, too bad! I'm not talking about a spin-off. This is a mainline Fire Emblem game with Persona aspects. Not some stupid pop idol spin-off. Okay, it's not stupid, but you know what I mean. First, you have to work. Boo! Sorry, but you're limited by your instructor level. There are also three gauges that limit how much you can do in a week. Instructor, stroll, and venture. The more you teach and interact with students, 
the more your instructor level increases. And the more that level increases, the more activities you can take part in. Granted, you're not exploring the streets of one of the biggest cities in the world. Instead, you can freely roam the campus grounds, visiting classrooms, discovering areas of the church, and shooting the breeze with your students. Teachers got a bond with their students, right? Hey, fellow cool kids. Mind if I smoke a dope with you? Well, the students seem to think so, as they'll ask you to be their personal counselor. You'll need to give them wise advice so they don't screw up their lives. Wow, this is really accurate. There are benefits to answering correctly, too. The better the answer, the more motivation the student will receive. Motivation, the meter we originally saw in the direct, allows you to teach your students more effectively. More motivation equals more times you can upgrade your students' stats. There are a ton of actions you can take as a teacher. You can help your students set goals, send them on group adventures, or spend some quality time over a meal. Everything you do benefits your stats and the stats of your students in one way or another. Kind of like Persona 5. Another similarity to Persona is the calendar. Each chapter is a month on the calendar, meaning the final day of the month ends the chapter. So everything you do for that month leads up to that final day. On weekdays, you do your typical teaching duties. On the weekends, you party. The final day is called field study. Once you clear the field study, the next chapter and month begins. Looking at the background, I wonder if you access the calendar from your room and then decide from there where to go. On the side are options for you to choose. Stroll, class, venture, rest, shop, and examination. Stroll and class sound simple enough, but venture could be the action you take to either send students out on missions or go on paralogue and side quests. Rest must be how you end the day. Shop is self-explanatory, although I wonder if the night guild is here or when you stroll. Either way, Anna better be leaving the shop or so help me. Lastly is examination, where you test your students so they can class change. Next thing you'll notice are the symbols on the calendar. Many of them are located on Sunday, the one day off you have, and it looks to be packed with activities from fishing to food. I doubt these activities will be incredibly engaging, but maybe it'll be a fun way to pass the time. The students also have their birthdays written on the calendar. That way you'll never forget Edelgard's birthday. <clears throat> June 22nd, <clears throat> new international holiday. <clears throat> Since Edelgard's birthday is written on the calendar, I assume Beleth is teaching the Black Eagles, an important distinction to make as we see the Lester coat of arms on the last day. Now, if Beleth was actually teaching the Golden Deer, this would probably mean the end of the chapter. However, since Edelgard's birthday is written on the calendar, the Black Eagles' task must take place in Leicester. So this implies your missions will not be limited to the house's country of origin. Oh my. What could have brought you here? It's time for the I don't want to talk too much about it, so I'll put it in here section. Ooh, my favorite. Like I said earlier, I'm not going to cover every gameplay detail. Famitsu has already done that for us. I do want to point out some important details, however. All units start off as either a commoner or a noble, the trainee class. Once they reach level five, they can upgrade into a base class, like Myrmidon, soldier, fighter, and monk. Once you reach level 10, you can change to mid-tier classes like Mercenary, Cavalier, Brigand, Brawler, Mage, and Dark Mage. However, unlike in recent Fire Emblem games, your level doesn't go back to 1. You stay at the level you class changed at. I imagine since you can class change as many times as you like, you keep the same level to avoid cheating the system. Another thing to note is Brawler and Dark Mage are male-only classes, which to me implies there are female-only classes as well. It's exciting to see the different combinations of weapons a class can use, and I'm excited to see what final classes will look like. Unfortunately, still no sign of Wyvern Riders, but maybe that's one of the higher classes? Returning to the units, there are more characters shown by Famitsu that didn't get full descriptions. Petra of the Black Eagles with Hubert standing close by. Ignis, a boy or girl from Golden Deer. I think he's a boy, but you never know. Standing next to Ignis is, well, I don't know. I don't think I've seen her before. You would think she's one of the mysterious Golden Deer girls, but the hair color and style don't match. Could this be a random NPC or a new student? Only time will tell. Ferdinand of the Bag Eagles eating a meal with Bernadena. Raphael of the Golden Deer with Leone. I swear those two are a couple or something. I need the juicy gossip on them stat. Casper of the Blue Lions telling a Linhart for bullying him. Finally, we have the sweet, beautiful Mercedes the Blue Lions next to Annette. You're making it really difficult to choose a house, Intelligent Systems. <laughs> You're welcome.
Praise the goddess Millis Turnwill is coming back, albeit under a different name. Celestial Beat, or at least that's how I translate it. But it more or less acts like Millis Turnwheel, allowing you to redo a number of times per mission in case you messed up. In the case of this battle, it's three times. Personally, I love it. It was one of the gameplay mechanics I wanted to see return in Fire Emblem Switch. Noob. Yes, I know I suck at video games. I made a whole video about it. But you can't convince me restarting a chapter over and over again is enjoyable. Oh, it's not. That's why I don't lose. You cocky little piece of- Oh, hey, look. The names of the mysterious Golden Deer Girls. Marianne and Lysithea. Lysithea? Lysithea. Who makes up these names? Lysithea. Sounds like Lys. It's like the Lys Princess. Lysithea! Definitely pronouncing it wrong. Marianne and Lysithea. Famitsu also gives us a look at the UI when Beleth is roaming the school grounds. On the top left corner is the current date, April 23rd. Below that is our current objective. Talk to the three house leaders. On the top right is a mini-map with our objectives pinpointed. Since this is probably when we decide which house to teach, I wonder if the game starts right on April 20th. After all, it's an important day in Fire Emblem history. That's right. Lucina's birthday! Oh, and Fire Emblem's anniversary. Guess that's cool too. Also, there's a cat right here. For the love of the goddess, please let us pet the kitty. So how long is this game anyway? Who knows? Might be a year? It might be as long as a typical Japanese high school. Personally, I think it'll be longer than a year, mainly because of this pick here. The date is August, but your instructor level is only D. Seems kind of low if we started the game in April and it's only a year long, so I think it's longer. There's a new clip located on the Japanese Three Houses website of Beleth reading a book. In it, the school bell rings and Beleth leaves the room. Nothing is really happening here. But the school bell is a shortened version of the Fire Emblem theme. Not gonna lie, I kinda love it. An image of Dorothea casting thunder shows no crest in the middle of the symbol, unlike when Linhart and this enemy mage casted a spell. I think this implies that these two have a crest, because we already know Dorothea doesn't have one. But I have no idea why Linhart, a Black Eagle member, has the crest that is on the Lester symbol. He must have some blood from that area of Folin or something. You confuse me, Linhart. Are you a man or a woman? I mean, that's actually not why you confuse me, but people still want to know. It's not clear. Remember this banner from the February Direct? I thought it was the symbol of the Church of Seros, or the Academy. But it turns out it's for the Knights of Seros. It makes sense that they presumably come from all three countries. Although, I still don't know what the star is supposed to represent. The Church of Seros' symbol makes a lot more sense. The crest of Seros under a hat with a white dragon guarding it. I'm pretty sure this dragon is supposed to be the white dragon pictured in this painting and might well be a reference to the goddess. This symbol is also front and center on the calendar, just in case you didn't know who owned you. I mean, the calendar. And by the way, this is most definitely what the Season of Warfare Special Edition calendar is based on. It makes a lot more sense to have a calendar now. It better have my favorite student's birthdays printed on it. Or so help me. As the mother of all life, the arbiter of every soul. To end our deep dive, let's finally address Beleth's crest and its connection to Sothis and Old Man Viking King. The Famitsu articles refer to the War of Heroes, the war fought between the Church of Seros and the Liberation King Nemesis. That war is where the Ten Greats come from. They were warriors who fought in the war. Although it doesn't say what side they fought for, my guess is, yeah, they fought for the Church of Seros since the victors of war are the ones who write history. If that's the case, maybe the other ten crests come from ten warriors who fought with Nemesis, and that's why we've heard nothing about them. Then again, it also makes sense that the ten heroes had two crests each. Throwing theories out there! Moving on, I think the battle from the E3 trailer is a battle that occurred during the War of Heroes. That means Old Man Viking King's name is actually Nemesis, the Liberation King. And the Lady in White is Seros. Maybe. Again, you never know with Monakeets. Maybe Rhea's ancestor was a general in Seros' army, and this is her fighting Nemesis. Or this really is the Divine Seros. Just keep my options open, people. The article goes on to say the church later established the Adrestian Empire, and the other two countries sprouted from that. Previously, I assumed the Empire had established the church, but apparently it's the other way around. Knowing that, having the crest of Seros everywhere in the monastery 
and with Edelgard's family makes a lot more sense. However, this presents a new problem. If crests only appear based on one's bloodline, Edelgard must be a descendant of Seros. So is Seros a monarchy or human? Does Edelgard have dragon blood? I was just kidding about her being a purple dragon. Only time will tell. Returning to Nemesis, he has Belette's crest on his shoulder and cape. In some way, the two are related, whether by blood or by who they know. That war happened thousands of years ago. How could they know the same people? <clears throat> oh yeah. Nemesis was able to talk with Sothis as evidenced by the crest. Now let's focus on the crest for a moment. Like I said before, it's an exact outline of this Church of Seros painting. I have three theories on what it could mean. One, this crest is called the Crest of Sothis. It was given to Sothis by the goddess and is the most powerful crest. Its power is meant to keep balance within Fodlan. Similar to how the goddess gave Seros a crest, she gave Sothis a crest as well, except her power was meant to maintain order in Fodlan. Seros became jealous and sealed Sothis away, stealing her memories. Nemesis, being a servant to Sothis, finds out about this and declares war on Seros' movement to take over Fodlan. Unfortunately, he fails. Sothis stays sealed for thousands of years until Beleth links with her mind for some reason. The issue with this theory is, how does Beleth get the crest if it was given to Sothis? Are they related? Oh, please no. No more dragons, please. 2. This crest is called the Crest of Sothis. Sothis is actually the goddess who gave the crest to mankind, with this crest being the most powerful one. She gave the crest to Nemesis, who passed it on through his bloodline to Beleth. In the E3 trailer, Rhea talks about a divine revelation for the goddess, a gift to help guide the lost. At first, I thought it meant all the crests, and maybe it does to an extent, but what if the gift is mainly referring to the crest of Seros, which Seros then used to establish the Adrestian Empire, the Church of Seros, and take over Fodlan? If the goddess gave crests to all her people, why did she allow Seros to take over the world? Rhea goes on to explain that the goddess watches over Fodlan from her kingdom above, which implies she isn't on the planet anymore. What if she couldn't stop Seros? What if Seros imprisoned her, wiped her memory, and took over the world in the name of the goddess? What if the goddess is Sothis? Okay, first she said Sothis is Seros, then her offspring, now she's the goddess for Pete's sake. Make up your mind! Yes, I know I'm all over the place, but it goes hand in hand with her amnesia, and it gives her importance. Seros became power hungry and locked Sothis away somewhere using the crest given to mankind. Oh yeah? Well explain this! Ah yes, the painting. Rhea implies this shows the goddess giving Seros the crest, but what if the image is painted over the goddess crest or symbol? Meaning, the symbol doesn't represent this moment. Rather, this moment was drawn over the symbol. This moment never happened. You got any facts to back that up, kid? Well, <laughs> no. But if Seros wanted to make people believe the church was good, forging a painting is not a bad way. 3. The crest is called the Crest of Sethlin. Sothis' real name is Sethlin, making her the goddess. Or, she is the daughter of Sethlin the goddess. Sothis guides those who are divinely called by her mother. The goddess icon or statue in this game is called Holy Sethlin Statue. We can see Dorothea and Hubert holding it at one point. Previous games had an item like this called Goddess Icon, but games like the Tellius games and Shadow of Valentia actually named the item after a god in the game. I think the same thing is happening here, meaning Sethlin is a god, if not the goddess worshipped by the people of Fodlin. Side note, Sethlin in Irish mythology is a prophetess and wife of Balor, king of the Fomorians. If you want to know more about it, check out my good friend Wikipedia. How that relates to Sothis and Beleth, I'm not positive. My gut tells me Beleth is a descendant of Nemesis, who first received the crest of Sethelin. After his defeat, the crest was hidden in the bloodline until Beleth. When that power awakens is when Sothis starts to appear. Also about the whip sword, since Sothis is featured holding the sword, I wouldn't be surprised if she was the one who gave it to Nemesis, who lost it to who we assume is Seros in battle, as seen in the E3 trailer. Beleth then receives it, or steals it, from the church at the request of Sothis. If she ever gets her memories back. <laughs> Hint, she will. Now. Three territories. Three houses. That is all the good stuff I could find in the Famitsu Direct. There are still some smaller details I failed to cover. I encourage you to read the Famitsu article or take a peek at the Serenus Forest translation if you want to learn more. Although, with E3 on the horizon, I'm sure we'll be seeing this info and more in a new trailer. 
for now we wait as always. Despite some worries I have, mostly about the frame rate and graphical fidelity, I am incredibly hyped. I'm ready to teach students for barely a livable salary. I'm ready to time travel more than Captain America. I'm ready to find out who the heck Saros and the Goddess are. I'm ready to play some Fire Emblem. Let's not do that today, Beleth. Okay, Morgana. You should go to bed. Yes, Morgana. Tell me you love me. Ah! Thank you so much for watching. Are you catching the Fire Emblem fever? Let us know in the comments below. Feel free to make fun of my silly theories or let me know what your own theories are. Be sure to subscribe if you want to hear more Nintendo goodness. Shout out to Chase, RamVP, Maiko, Joseph, and a new patron, Giranu. Thanks everyone for your support. My goal is to make it to 2,000 subscribers before E3. I've got a special video prepared for when we reach that, so please look forward to that. Goodbye, you good people.